world is becoming increasingly urbanised. As city populations grow, the demand for services, but also pressure on resources, will increase. How to make cities inclusive, resilient and sustainable? Let us shape smart and livable cities as places where traditional networks and services are made more efficient with the use of digital and telecommunication technologies for the benefit of its inhabitants and business. Ladies and gentlemen, many experts believe that the planet's fate could be decided by cities and towns. By 2050, two-thirds of the world's population will be living in urban centers, putting strain on energy, water, waste, mobility, and other services and resources. The good news is, and many in the audience know this from experience because they themselves are working in this space, it is at local level that much of the most interesting climate innovation is taking place. And we heard a little bit about that yesterday from John Kerry when he spoke. Forward-looking cities are absolutely seizing opportunities to reduce emissions and to develop climate-resistant infrastructure. In this session, we want to explore the innovative approaches that are being taken by livable cities, especially with regard to the use of digital and telecommunications smart technologies. And in just a moment, I want to introduce our eminent speakers. But first of all, I want to just let everybody know we're very eager to get your opinion, as always, on our audience poll question. And I see some of you are voting already, but we'd like a lot more people to take part. Go to the Slido function on the live stream if you are a registered user, and you can answer this question. In your opinion, does smart city technology support resilience at both the individual and the public scale? So does smart city technology support resilience at the individual and also at the public level? So please vote and we'll come back and take a look in just a moment at the results. And now I am very pleased to introduce our speakers and as always, I'm going to keep the introductions brief so we have more time for discussion. And I'm going to also ask our speakers to do the same when they do answer our questions that they keep their own responses to under three minutes in length. Thank you so much. I welcome Claude Turm, Minister for Energy and Minister for Spatial Planning in Luxembourg. Welcome. It's also a pleasure to have with us Rana Adib, Executive Director, Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st Century, which is a global public-private multi-stakeholder network on renewable energy based at the United Nations Environment Program. Regina Gunther is Senator for the Environment, Transport and Climate Protection in the local government here in Berlin. Piero Pelizzaro is Chief Resilience Officer for the Municipality of Milan and advisor to the Italian Ministry of Environment on Urban Climate Adaptation Policy. And Marika van Donink is Deputy Mayor for Spatial Development and Sustainability for the City of Amsterdam. And we are still working to get a connection with, uh, with one uh, panelist, so I'm very sorry that we can't uh, see all five on screen yet, but I hope that we will be able to do so in just a moment. So let us now take a quick look at the audience poll results before we do go to, audience, uh, go to our, our questions to our panel. So, and we see that uh, there are a great many more yeses than noes, but 14% do say that at the moment, smart city technology does not support resilience at both the individual and public scale. So, and with that, let me now go to the panel and ask each of you to tell us, if you would, about the biggest challenges that you face in terms of uh, energy innovation and smart city policies and how you are approaching those challenges. And again, we are very, we are very happy if we can have, please, uh, fairly brief answers. So let me begin uh, and just go straight down the panel, starting with Claude Tourmas. Oh, 
Oh, I'm sorry, it's Claude who's not with us. Excuse me, uh, sorry. Then let us go uh, to you, Rana Adib. Thank you so much, and thank you for the opportunity for being here. Um, so uh, you will not be astonished to hear that uh, I will focus on renewable energy, and I think uh, how to make cities inclusive, resilient, and sustainable is clearly with renewables. Um, what uh, brings me to say this is not that we are launching the Renewables and Cities Global States Report tomorrow, or that we are a renewable energy network, but clearly the reality that um, Cities are uh, very um, impacted by climate change. They need to um, become more resilient. It does have an impact on their energy infrastructures. And as a result, renewable energy can really help. Sorry, I have the peril noise here um, from the call with Claude. I hope that you don't hear this. Um, in... So with regard to renewable energy, what the challenges are we have identified by researching basically globally what is happening in cities is that cities are indeed very ambitious when it comes to implementing renewable energy targets. So there is a huge commitment and to also look into renewable electricity, not only but also in renewables in building and in transport. They also have regulator frameworks, so policies engaged. But the reality is that cities in general do face, I guess, like two main challenges I would like to, to underline here. One is clearly um, resources, and this can be expertise, but it can also be access to finance. And this has certainly been increased by COVID um, pressure too. The other one is, however, also that national frameworks might not always empower cities in the way they need to be empowered to really play the key role they have to play in driving the transition. What is also important to see is that cities themselves, and that's something we see globally, we see many cities engaging. One billion people live in cities with renewable energy targets and policies, but many cities do not see themselves historically as renewable energy player or as key actor in the transition. And that is clearly something where information, facts and dialogues like here will contribute to bridge, I get the city space, and the energy transition space. Thank you very much. And I see that we do now have Minister Turma with us. Uh, I hope that you can hear and uh, see everybody uh, very well. Minister, thank you for joining. And uh, sorry, the technology took a little time to get off the ground. I wanted to start out by asking all of the panel to talk a little bit about what you see as the most crucial approaches for making cities more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable, including through smart technologies. And also to just mention a couple of the challenges associated with that. So I will go straight to you, Minister, uh, for your own response. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, so I think what is important to understand in this climate crisis is that technology alone will not solve entirely the problem. Uh, so uh, of course, we have solar energy, we have wind energy, we have energy efficient buildings, we have electromobility, we have public transport. but we must go beyond that. And beyond that is, I think, uh, on, on two things. One is um, the social fabric around uh, the, 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 the climate change. Uh, all of us know we need CO2 taxation. We need a price for CO2. But the price for CO2 will risk to divide the society uh, between uh, the richer parts and the poorer parts. So... And the second thing is uh, really this kind of um, so we need we need money at national level and at city level to compensate for that. I give you an example. In Luxembourg, we have introduced a CO2 taxation, and 50 percent, so five zero percent of that, uh, we take to compensate financially uh, the the 30 percent of population which have the least income, and on that. Uh, so and that's extremely extremely important in order to 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 keep uh, the adhesion of all parts of society and the second thing is really this strategic alliance between national urban planning i'm also uh, spatial the minister of urban or spatial planning and urban planning in luxembourg and the cities because we need lifestyle changes in addition to technology and lifestyle changes of um, I take the bike and I leave the car. Uh, I um, 
uh, basically I, I go over to, to having more vegetables and meat and I, I want to have it in a garden which is close to me, which, need, which means spaces for urban gardening in the city. So all these things, so the social cohesion and completely reorganizing our cities uh, for more green, for more humanity, for more spaces, for this kind of lifestyle changes. Uh, for that, we need also money. And one thing which uh, President of Commission von der Leyen said yesterday is completely counterproductive. If EU is now planning to move building and transport into the EU ETS, that means that Brussels takes the money, which is at national level, to organize the social cohesion and to help cities to, to do this kind of greening uh, and moves it to, to Brussels. And that is completely counterproductive. So my call from here goes also to European Commission. Don't mix EU ETS with uh, transport and buildings. Leave transport and buildings in national competence. The, the national level is much, much better placed to, to, to ensure the social cohesion and to help in a partnership with cities to green the cities and to make lifestyle changes in a positive way possible. Thank you very much uh, for that. And I want to come back also to what you said about uh, planning uh, a little bit later on. But let me first go now to Begina Gunther with a request for uh, the same issue uh, to talk about what you see as the most crucial approaches for making uh, Berlin livable and resilient. Certainly Berlin often gets very high ratings uh, on rankings of livable cities worldwide. Uh, what are you doing to make sure it stays that way or even improves? Yeah, thank you, Melinda, for the invitation. I'm very pleased uh, to be with you and to hear what the other panelists uh, present, because we are in a worldwide transition process. Cities are places um, uh, where people live in mostly very uh, dense uh, environments and uh, economic activities take place. So we are now um, in, in, uh, in a situation where the development patterns of the last 70 years um, that uh, uh, built uh, more or less uh, a car-friendly um, uh, uh, environment now um, is challenged and that means we have to reorganize our cities uh, completely. Um, uh, we have uh, a lot of challenges. Um, uh, uh, let me name uh, some of them. It's uh, air pollution. It's uh, uh, obviously contributing to climate uh, change through burning fossil fuels in the energy sector, but as well in the transport sector. Um, and we uh, have um, the uh, problem of the uh, uh, reorganizing the uh, energy sector, moving away from coal to renewables. Um, the uh, uh, concept of the past um, uh, that uh, we have to reorganize our cities through or the mobility around the uh, cars uh, led to a more or less uh, very unjust uh, distribution of the rare public space. We have uh, a lot of space that is provided for mobility and very less space that is provided to people. So Berlin um, now um, has uh, 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 started to want to rethink and reorganize uh, uh, cities uh, or the lives of the citizens. Um, that means we have a new law uh, here in Berlin that uh, take priority for bikes, public transport and pedestrians uh, over private cars. We have reorganized the, or we are uh, in the process to reorganize the uh, financial flows. 
um, uh, in a direction to uh, the non-fossil fuel uh, energies and uh, uh, to give more, much more money to install uh, renewables. And uh, what uh, Claude Thomas uh, already mentioned, uh, we are uh, thinking completely new about public space and how to distribute that. That means uh, we make uh, the space for private cars much, much more expensive. We want to give disincentives um, and we want to uh, give more incentives to people to use uh, public uh, transport. So it's a whole range of how to reorganize not only by new technologies, it's about reorganize the society. And by reorganizing the society, that means that we need to think about new places where the city, citizens can be part of this transition. And that is uh, where we are at the moment. Um, uh, and uh, what I can see or uh, from uh, the Berlin citizens that people are willing to, um, uh, to move. They want to have an other environment um, and they want to have more space for their children close to the, um, their uh, homes and not only uh, far away in the environment of Berlin and Brandenburg. So um, it's a whole movement to move away from the old uh, uh, idea of what a city looks like in order to have a new city. Thank you. And let me go over to Marika van Dornick also to hear what approaches Amsterdam, another city that tends to score very high on ratings of livable cities, what Amsterdam uh, is doing in this space. And uh, I was interested when uh, Minister Thomas was talking to hear his reference to different sectors that clearly uh, all to join them up requires absolutely getting out of silos because he was talking about transport, energy, retail, uh, food consumption, and so on. So clearly one of the crucial aspects of approaches but also challenges is to get a really joined up approach. Or am I wrong? I think that's that, that, that's exactly right. I, I heard a few things that I thought that sounded so familiar because it's exactly what Amsterdam is also doing. Uh, as co of course, as a city government, you do have a responsibility. But in a way, if, if we really want to make this change, if we really want to make this big transition, it's about everybody within the city that takes its part, that plays a role, and that has a, share, has a responsibility, but also has ownership of this, of this uh, transition. And it was said before that actually we, we tend to, uh, to see the energy transition as a technical transition. And by just changing fossil fuels to biofuels, changing your, your, your normal car to an electric car, but that is not the real change that we need. That's not the real transition that we need. The energy transition is a social transition. And if we can't do it in that way, Injustice is is really is really around the corner because as as it was said, if we hire the gas prices, then rich people can still afford it, but others can't. So we have to go through a structure change in order to make a just and equal uh, 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 energy transition, where actually we also have a completely different way of looking at what a city needs in order to thrive. Uh, we have to look at another way of what we mean by um, economical prosperous. Do we need growth or do we just need to prosper? Do we need to thrive as a city? And I do believe that that, and I think, I think it was said before, that cities do have an ecosystem in order to make that happen because we have quite good contacts with our businesses. We have the contact with uh, the citizens in, in, uh, in the city. Um, so I believe that as a government, we can provide direction give direction and saying where we want to go. As Amsterdam, we made sure that our ambitions is very clear. We want to be a climate neutral by 2050, but we also want to reduce our emissions by 55% 
in 2030, we're looking at uh, uh, both the built environment, so getting natural gas out of the housing and get sustainable heating into housing. We're looking at the industry. We are looking at mobility, I think, in the same way as Berlin is doing. Get on your bike, get out of your car, but also provide less space for cars and promote public transport, but also looking at how can we actually make energy uh, in our own city by solar panels, by, by, by wind energy. So there's many ways where we're looking at, but we're also looking at how can we make sure that we are not just telling others what to do, but actually saying to others, come up with your ideas, because we believe as a government, we can't do this alone. And actually, we don't have all the knowledge and we don't have all the expertise. And as long as we are telling people what to do, it will be our responsible and we have to do it. Where actually, if we invite citizens, businesses to come up with their ideas and to give them space in order to do that, and even to give them space to sometimes fail, uh, because we're in, in the midst of this transition, we don't know all the ways. We, we know our goal and we have to find the ways how we want to do it. And I do think that, that, that for us, one of the most important things is, is that we have to become not only a sustainable and resilient city, but what's set in, in the question, we have to be an inclusive city. And that is why we as a city adopted the donut economy model of Kate Rayworth, where actually uh, what it means to be a thriving city means that we ensure progress within the ecological and social boundaries. That means that whatever we do, we don't want to uh, cause more climate change. We don't want to cause more emissions. Actually, we have to reduce them. We have to reduce the pollution that we're, we're ma making in order to stay within these ecological boundaries. And at the same time, make sure that we also keep the social foundation of our city very strong. So that means that everybody has adequate housing, everybody has shelter, everybody has enough money to live. And this, I think this is a double task that we have to do in order to get to this transition. And actually, on top of that, it's not only our responsibility to do that for Amsterdam, but also for the rest of the world. And that means that we really have to look at the way that we consume and produce, because we know that our consumption is actually having a very bad effect on other parts of the world. Uh, so this holistic approach will help us in this idea of an inclusive city. Thank you so much. And let me go to uh, Piero Pelizaro now, who has been so patiently waiting to talk about what you see as innovative approaches that you are taking uh, in Milan. And by the way, that word innovative, I want to talk about innovative governance a little bit later, picking up on what we also just heard about getting citizens involved. But, but generally speaking, uh, Piero Pelizaro, what are you doing in Milan to make sure that your city will be sustainable and livable going forward? Well, uh, first of all, let me start from the governance part because it was one of my points. Uh, two years ago, uh, our mayor, Mayor Sala, has decided to become the deputy mayor in charge for climate change and environment. And the first thing he, he did was to reorganize the structure of the, uh, of the public administration. So we have created a new department. It is the Environmental Transition Department. It is composed by three areas. It's composed by three areas, energy and, uh, energy and climate, water and waste and the city residents. These three areas are working on mainstreaming of the transition and the climate neutrality approach to all the different departments. So the first thing that I think we need as a city is to reorganize ourselves to make sustainable, resilience, and smart approach that has been adopted by all the other departments. Saying that, what we have done, we have basically we are working on three main things at the moment. One is the time of the city. We always underestimate when we look at uh, the climate transition the concept of time, time of the, of the city, time of the mobility, time of the services, time of the work. So we are now working on a new time plane of the city that could be help us to reduce congestion, to make the city more close to our citizens, so also to bring uh, to them in the 15-minute uh, cities concept. And uh, this is one. The other point is care, care of the public space, improving the green, but also the livability uh, of the city. We have launched a program of uh, tactical urbanism in Piazza Aperte, as well of an, also Strada Aperte, the open street, to increase uh, the kilometers of bike line. But it is a main concept is to increase the capacity of the population, of the community to live together, to dialogue. So it's not a matter only of climate, it's a matter of creating opportunity and space for conversation. So, and conversation creates innovation, space creating 
also, uh, let's say, collective remember, because one of the things we believe that it's not everything technological driven. Sometimes the solution comes from the past. So for us, resilience is innovation plus memory. Collectively remember is one of the key points to uh, bring back nature to the city because basically all of us are speaking about planting trees around. Our city were full of trees uh, before the Second World War or before the First World War. And then the car-driven society comes and everything changes. So planting trees is not an innovation. It's bringing back memory to the city. And last, let me say, to take in my three minutes slot, uh, I go to what Claude was saying before. He say, takes building and transport at the national level. I will say something more. Takes building and transport at the city level, because I think cities are even more capable than the national level to understand which is the need of the public transport. We are now working on a full electric uh, uh, fleet uh, for our public transport before 2030. But we also understand more than a national level how we should redesign and rethinking our building in terms of energy features. So I think that city should be sit at the table uh, to get access directly to the structural fund. In Italy, it's not possible yet. It are only small pieces. In other countries, I know it's possible, but city should, go, should have a certain site direct asset to the structure of found because then from the European Union you go directly close to the people and that is how you feel to be part of a bigger picture of that is the European Union. Minister Turm, did I uh, just see a signal from you that you would like to speak to that point? Uh, your, your microphone seems to be on mute, sir. Um, do I have to unmute it? Uh, myself or yeah, you're somebody? Our, well, you're with us now, so please, uh, you have. Okay, the good. But um, I think we we are uh, we seem to be in full agreement. We need money for the social fabric, and we need money uh, to rebuild the cities. Uh, and uh, be aware, and and that will be a big fight if EU Commission uh, takes transport and buildings into the EU ETS. Then national governments will not be able anymore to help cities because national governments will have no money anymore uh, to, to, to do this. So I think that is really an important fight and I hope that cities can join those countries in Europe which don't want uh, this move. Uh, the, the other thing is what I find really uh, interesting is that yesterday the, the Pfizer Prize, which is a bit the Nobel Prize for architecture, uh, went to uh, two French architects uh, and urbanists, Anne Lacaton and Jean-Philippe Vassal. When you see what these architects and urbanists have done, it's exactly what we need. Uh, when they were asked 20 years ago to reconfigure uh, an urban space, they said this urban space is, is perfect. Just uh, add some trees, uh, give people a bit more uh, places to, to sit down and organize what, uh, what you just mentioned from, from Milan, which is uh, places where people can have conversa conserva con conversations. So the city is the uh, lieu d'excellence. It's a place for, for, for um, people who meet and, and build a new vision and, and build uh, an, an, uh, uh, basically the, the, the collective move into um, local food, uh, uh, local, so, so moving with bicycles and, and space for children. And, and, the, and it's really interesting that the Nobel Prize for Architecture went yesterday exactly to, to architects and urbanists which have this in the focus. And we need this kind of also rethinking of part of sea specialists to help Minister, us. may I just ask you, because you, are, you have emphasized resources uh, twice, and uh, clearly that is a major challenge that cities are facing as they make this transition. Now, Luxembourg, as I understand it, became the first European country last fall to launch a sustainable uh, bond framework. Can you tell us how that could play out at city level? What kind of resources that could generate? And do you see sustainable bonds as one avenue also for cities as they are seeking to uh, leverage resources? It, thank you for that question, because what we need is we need targets and policy instruments. We need the cities and this partnership with cities. And the third thing we need is we need guidance 
for the financial markets. And I can say this from being in a, in a government which has the opportunity to be one of the largest uh, fund places in the world. Uh, and sustainable criteria for banking and investment funds is extremely, extremely important. We have to get out of black fossil investments and into green investments. And again here, uh, I, have, uh, I have to make it a bit political. We have last year decided at EU level to have a whole framework for financial services, which is called the taxonomy, which is uh, how do we define what is a green investment, a sustainable investment? And that was a big fight which the European Parliament and the progressive governments won. So now, uh, the last days I got the information that at the highest level of EU Commission, Mrs. von der Leyen, Mr. Mr. Timmermans, that they are considering to bring gas, fossil gas, back into the definition of green investments and to bring nuclear energy uh, on the same level than renewable energy in, in the uh, definition of EU what is green. And uh, also from, from, from taking this opportunity, if that happens, I think financial markets will be completely disorientated. Uh, nuclear is clearly not part of the yeah. solution and gas can also not be part of the solution. So also, again, it's very nice that Mr. Van der Leyen opened this important uh, Berlin Energy Days yesterday. But if in the same moment EU Commission is right. uh, okay. organizing... Uh, counter-productive uh, policy instruments at EU level, yeah. then it will be damn difficult for us at national level and at city level to have banks and investment funds helping us to invest into green, right. what is really green, and we need that. Okay, thank you very much. Let me uh, link that up to the energy transition in cities, and I'm going to do that via uh, a word cloud question that we have posed to the audience, and we've gotten some interesting answers. Um, we asked, how should the smartness of a smart city be measured? I'm hoping that our panel can see the answers that our audience has been sending in to us. A number of them, not all of them, but many of them do relate to energy issues, among them banning combustion engines, uh, uh, somewhere else uh, on here or on the, the second word cloud, we had 100% renewables, green accessibility, energy efficiency, and so on. So let me now go back to the panel and ask you, if we are talking about the challenges of the energy transition in cities and getting a coherent vision that is also driven by local needs and local citizens' desires. How do we join that up with, with initiatives at the federal and even EU level? Because what we're hearing from Minister Tormes is that we don't have what policy nerds call policy coherence. We've got one set of goals and, and policies at EU level, maybe another one at national level, and now all of you talking about what you think your cities need in terms of bottom-up self-determination. A big challenge. How do we link it up when it comes to energy? And I'll go straight down the panel once again. Rana Adli. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a very good point and I feel that it also connects very much to the discussion we had before. So what is very apparent is that the city agenda and the priorities here are not always under the energy umbrella. The reality is that energy and moving from fossil fuel to an efficient and renewable energy system and economy and society is something which needs to happen. So we need to ban fossil fuel and support energy efficiency and renewable energy. And I think what needs to happen here from the energy side, and uh, I include Rankin One in this, is to position the renewable energy debate. And I think that's the first thing to do in a different way. It is when it's about mainstreaming renewable energy, we need the political support, we need market support, we need citizen support. And this is why cities have such a key role because all these players are part of the city environment. Um, and this also means that we need to show how the transition, the energy transition 
does allow um, the different players to meet this agenda of a healthy environment, of air pollution, of livable cities, of city engagement, citizens' engagement. And um, that's certainly for the first thing to do. Building on this, it also means that um, we need to get out of our silos with regard to this. It is not enough to have basically the energy ministry speaking about the energy debates. Um, it needs to be all ministries together and all governance together. And I think that some of the cities and some of the national government that have been really successful are the ones that have put um, cross-cutting topic like climate in their decision, whether it's an interministerial committee, whether it is in the US, a very, uh, very forward looking part on putting basically climate into the security um, council. These are things that are fundamental. Now, cities can really bring another way of thinking here because the systems approach is fundamental. Why do we need cities? Also, the national governments do need cities to reach basically um, their energy transition targets. 80% of the energy we consume is being consumed for heating, cooling and transport, 80%. And these are the sectors where basically we have only shares of 10% or 3% of renewable energy and the transition is not happening in the same way as in the electricity sector. The solutions here are local. The solutions are local jobs, it's local technologies, it's local policies to some extent. And I think what, what is important is really to give cities a legislative power, but also a, t a seat basically at the table when it comes down to define national policies and obviously also access to finance. What I think is really interesting because we are all, I mean, working towards moving to this transition. Citizens can create a lot of pressure on policymakers to be more ambitious. And I think that is clearly something to use and which is also being used uh, from the city side. So partnerships between cities is important. And uh, we have, for instance, the example of the Republic of South Korea, where the cities clearly work together to create a certain pressure on the national governments to be more ambitious and engaged in the decarbonization. So I think it's not only about multi-level governance, so between the governance levels and an integrated approach, it's also about the sectors working together and it is also about the cities working together to create a, a stronger impact, I guess, and mobilize um, economic players and citizens. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I have an eye on the clock. Our time is unfortunately quite limited. We have about five or six minutes, so uh, I would be very grateful for shortish answers from, uh, from our remaining uh, three uh, panelists. Also on this same issue of how we get coherent joined up action and also coherent joined up financing issue uh, support for uh, the uh, livability initiatives that all of you have talked about and uh, are clearly prioritizing in your cities. So Regina Gunther, how is this playing out in Germany? We meet here under the auspices of two federal ministries. Would you say we have policy coherence in terms of the goals of a city like Berlin and uh, the framework and the financing at national level? Um, I would say we are on our way. Uh, we need a better top-down approach. That is what Claude was mentioning, that uh, the European uh, legislation is not really uh, linked very good to the, our national legislation and as well to the community or the municipality legislation. And if this um, will not uh, speed up, that we have a coherent um, uh, approach, I think it will be very difficult to speed up the transformation. That is why we need the bottom-up approach. What we have seen in the past here in Berlin, that once citizens organize themselves, they are really able to pressure local politicians and the local politicians pressure the national uh, politicians in order to um, uh, uh, to to make the change uh, uh, happen. And so um, it's a kind of uh, both an uh, interlinkage between bottom up and top down. And um, so what um, uh, was already mentioned, if the uh, highest level, in our case, the European one, is not giving up uh, or is not giving the right incentives to us, 
um, then uh, it will be very difficult uh, for us to uh, bring on, uh, here in the cities uh, the right results or the wished results on the ground. Um, so um, I would support uh, the uh, uh, the idea that uh, in the EU ETS, uh, transport and the building sector should not be integrated. It will make the change here in cities much more difficult. Um, so we need to think very uh, uh, carefully if we would go such a move and what implication that would mean. Okay. And so um, um, I would uh, uh, strengthen um, uh, what have said um, uh, we need uh, a proper framework on the European level, then on the national level, and then we are able on the municipality level to bring them into the right direction. If that is not the case, it makes our life very difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Let me move straight away to Marika van Dornick. You. And I, I do think it's it's very recognizable what everybody's saying. I think what what we, what we need is that to use the power of innovation that is in the cities, because we have you know the citizens, the the, the companies that that want to move onwards. But quite often, national legislation is not quick enough or not flexible enough to to ac accommodate this innovation. So. Uh, if before, let's say, we have to do things completely different, at least give cities the innovation space to make a difference. For example, we are now in Amsterdam looking at smart grids, where actually neighborhoods exchange energy and get off the grid and actually do it by themselves. It means great responsibility for citizens, ownership, uh, support for the energy transition, but also to show what actually can happen. So I do support the fact that we need to have these legislations different, but let's at least give cities this room for innovation, this room for uh, also making our own mistakes, but to make sure that we that we support and incubate these new energies before we make it into national legislation, because then we are quite often too late. And there is this, let's say, local energy that we can actually in, you know, both in a in in a, in a people's energy as well as as green energy that we can use so much in order to make the changes uh, that we need. One one thing that I saw uh, uh, in the in in the cloud word cloud it was was the word uh, comfort, and and I do think that actually in order to to go to your citizens and talk about energy uh, transitions, it's not always about green. It's also just to give more comfortable comfort and a more livable house, and then the energy transition comes uh, by itself. Itself, as long as cities have this possibility to uh, to make their own decisions on legislations around smart grids, etc. Thank you very much. And also that mention of smart grids, very interesting because uh, before the lunch break today, I moderated a panel on citizens energy projects. And we often think of these as being projects for rural areas that maybe uh, aren't even connected to the grid. But in fact, experimentation is going on in urban centers as well. And it's very interesting indeed. Let me finally go back to Pierre Pelizaro to talk a little bit about how you see this nexus between the different policy levels and also have course, between the different levels of investment and resource support uh, in your own case. And you're welcome to mention concrete examples like that one, uh, because I think that helps us all understand the best practices part of this. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let, let me give you an example. We are developing a lot of uh, on the public transport, especially going to uh, electric public transport, to also to build new line and new infrastructures. This comes thanks to the 10T, that is a financial instrument of the European Commission. So it's when the national government is not taking uh, a top-down approach, but it's an enabler of facilitation and dialogue with the European Commission that's supposed to be the role of the national government, that could be much, much, it's much easier for us to go from the European level financial instrument to the ground to realize the infrastructures. So when, I, as I said before, I think that the city, at least metropolitan areas, should be part of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the process, of the negotiation process on the EU structural fund and on the policy vision. Because what we need, it's pretty clear for us what the European Union has defined in terms of climate neutrality. But then if we have the European vision, the national vision, at, in Italy we also have the regional vision because it's a really different level to get access to infrastructure, to funding and to policy, that they become 
a bit complicated for us as a city because in the meantime, someone is thinking if climate change is happening and what we should do it, climate change is impacting on the city. So we need to uh, make closer uh, the chain between the, the European Union and the cities because then it's when we shorten the time of reaction or time of action to fight climate change. And then let me uh, end in with a with quote. The quote is from Altiero Spinelli, when one of the fathers of the European Union. He was speaking about the European Union of people and region. I think we have to move in that direction, where maybe region could become cities and metropolitan areas, because then is when you can get more close to people. Thank you so much. Great closing words there. Minister, I'm very sorry, but we are out of time. So uh, I, I unfortunately can't take any more uh, interventions at the moment. I can only say thank you so much to all of you for this very, very interesting and engaging discussion on the role of livable cities in the global energy transition.